Mr. Guntram Kraus, uh, the chair for the session one, uh, is member of uh, Fitch uh, Germany, eh? and uh, he chair of the, the session. Eh? Okay. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Good morning, everybody. It's an honor, a pleasure for me to welcome you in this very nice building here in this uh, auditorium. I would like uh, to give you a very short introduction to Industry 4.0 and then we will have three presentations. You see here the speakers and I'll hope that we will have time for some question uh, every each presentation. As I was talking to my wife about this year's conference, she was wondering, what the hell does meaning industry 4.0? I had to consult Wikipedia. Industry 4.0 is a name for the current trend of automation and data exchange in manufacturing technologies. It includes, it includes cyber physical systems, the Internet of Things, cloud computing, machine to machine communication, and cognitive computing. Yes, that's Industry 4.0. I hope you have understand what it is. But this is, a, this is a fourth period, what, what was before. The so-called first period was defined by mechanization, water power and steam power. What a century was it? Can you help me? The 18th century, okay. The second period was defined by mass production, assembly line, and electricity, not steam power, electricity. And the third one, by computer and automation. And now the fourth, which is cyber physical systems. How do you can understand the fourth generation? I will tell you a little story. During my last holidays in Switzerland, I was shopping in the co-op supermarket. There you get a hand scanner, a device like a smartphone. And before you put an item, for example, a bottle of oil, you have to scan uh, the bottle of oil with the device. And on the display, you see what is is. It's a bottle of oil. It costs, for instance, three uh, uh, CA, uh, Swiss franc, and, and so on. And you go around the supermarket, and after your shopping tour, you bring the device to an automatic cash desk. And uh, there is an interaction without human intervention and you get your uh, list of your uh, buying and um, you get the option to pay by card or cash, cash in euro or Swiss franc. Yes, that is in my eyes shopping 4.0. Let's come uh, to our session. Our first speaker is Edward Smith, UK. Ed, uh, we know each other uh, since a long time. And uh, Ed was uh, with uh, BT and he retired uh, shortly time. Ed Holtz and BSC and a PhD from Honorable English Universities. Ed is still very active in research 
and his re research areas, network modeling and development of new ICT telecommunications propositions. Ed is board member of FITSE UK, and what I sincerely know, he is very busy in FITSE. You see it, he has not only one presentation, he has two presentations, and I think you are a member of a panel too. <laughs> Ed is married and has two adult children, a granddaughter and a cat, and that is interesting. Both are still in conflict over which of them rules the world, the granddaughter or the cat. Uh, by the way, I am convinced only money rules the world. Ed is an active sportsman and likes music. Now we are curious about your presentation. Ed, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Gunther. Right. So. Excellent. Uh, thank you for coming. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about control systems and their relationship to the Internet of Things. And I'm going to go back to probably factory 3.0 or possibly 2.5 to start with. So I'm going to look at some factory systems that I was involved with back in the late 1970s. And then show you a prototype that brings us right up to date and hopefully it gives a lot of simplification, uh, just to show you how technology has moved on and how it makes more possible. Then I'll go on and tell you a little bit about um, comparing the two to show you what's changed, and then we'll look at what makes life a little bit more complicated and some of the challenges we've got to overcome to deliver Factory 4.0. Um, so you talk about the Internet of Things and you, you end up talking about, very loosely, about the combination of uh, ICT and telecommunications. You talk about the number device proliferation. You talk about uh, even specific protocols that uh, the boffins at the IETF came up for for controlling uh, coffee pots. Uh, I want to really go into uh, the nitty gritty of things and start with two factory systems. So this is the late 1970s. I'm going to talk about uh, controlling a factory system uh, for making biscuits. Uh, and <clears throat> just to get you really in the mood for lunch, uh, talk about managing the production of crisps. Uh, to avoid confusion, these are the small flat pieces of potato that we in the UK call uh, crisps and the Americans call other things. Uh, I'm going to talk about the um, interfa interface of the classic devices to the computer system. So that will be switches and indicators, so uh, controls, but also coupling in analog devices. And the key thing about the PDP-11 was that you were able to use this thing called memory mapped I.O. And what this allowed you to do is put a piece of control equipment directly interfacing to the machine's bus that would allow you to take in signals, convert them, and read them on a polled basis without interrupts. That being important because these computers had a lot less memory and uh, a lot less processing power. So this is the Halston loop, which was quite advanced for its date. Uh, it starts with a, a series of very specialist terminals that uh, simplified uh, data input by giving you uh, specific function keys. These were translated by a series of controllers that were based on M6800 uh, Motorola controllers that were linked by a primitive uh, Cambridge ring. So we're talking pre-internet here. And they would go synchronously into the PDP-11. So this would allow uh, factory floor operators to input information about the way operating systems were changing, conditions were changing. Then we would have the checkways interfacing through the media system. So the media would uh, 
<coughs> convert the analog weight signal, which was continuously monitored, into a digital signal, would check it to see if it was in regulation. And if it was not in regulation, the computer would authorize the checkware to reject the uh, pack of biscuits. Uh, it had three main uses. Uh, plant was monitored to see if it was active, if it was broken down. Indicators would, were given to maintenance men who would come out, fix things, and note when it was back in production. We would monitor the production levels, and also we would monitor the quantity of weight that uh, was produced. Chris was uh, different. This is a schematic of uh, a checkware. Uh, we would control 70 of these on a computer with uh, 32 kilowords at 64 kilobytes of memory. Um, the basic thing was uh, we were interested in maintaining the weight of crisps within regulation but without giving away too much product. We control this um, through uh, a switch at the bottom right there, and that would have indicators. Uh, and when you wanted to switch to computer control, uh, the computer would see the activation of, of a signal, decide that that meant uh, you wanted to switch over, check its tables, do internal processing, and acknowledge takeover. And then the fun starts. The crisps would come across from the ovens in a huge overhead um, <coughs> conveyor belt that would have tributaries off it that would have vibrators that would shake the crisps down towards the way pan. Access to the way pan is um, controlled by this thing called the lip gate. Uh, so the first thing to make a pack of crisps, the PDP-11 does, is switch on the vibrators, which is on the lip gate, and switches off the dump gate so that no crisps can fall into the bag. Uh, crisps fall into the checkware. Uh, the computer, once it believes minimum weight will be uh, achieved, having made account for the fact that there are mechanical delays in this system, so there is latency, uh, will calculate roughly how many it thinks will fall into the pan between it giving the instruction to close the gate and the gate closing, will then take the weight and dump the bag into, um, sorry, activate, close the lip gate, open the dump gate, dump the bag, and once the bag has been dumped and sealed, immediately restart the whole process by closing the dump gate, opening the lip gate, and restart the vibrators. So that was quite an expensive system to put in, took a lot of people. Since then, a lot's happened, and you'll hear a lot about it in the conference, that the cost of computing is reduced, um, performance is reduced, sorry, performance is improved, uh, programming is much simpler, people are more familiar with computers and therefore less phased, no need for specialist terminals, and electronics have... Uh, <coughs> become more uh, important. So we move on to the next application, which is a prototype called the Marauder's Map. Those of you that uh, know Harry Potter will uh, get the idea of what this is very quickly. Uh, it's a prototype based on a Raspberry Pi computer, and it's run in Python. So all the other systems were run in assembler, so this is a lot simpler. And indeed, this was only 40 lines of Python. We're using very standard things, so a wireless LAN in a home, because we're going to monitor uh, the activity within the home by picking up uh, motion through uh, passive infrared detectors. And we'll upload that, uh, oops, sorry, that information uh, to a server on the internet. And we can use that for monitoring uh, vulnerable adults, so it's in one person's home and we check every day just to make sure they're moving about and they're okay and there's not, nothing to worry about. So this is what a Raspberry Pi looks like. Uh, the size is the size of uh, your credit card. It's a little bit thicker, $35, there is a, 35 euros rather, there is a 
much smaller one that would be five to ten euros these days. It's got limited storage, but it has this thing. So just below uh, the yellow socket, there is a row of 16 pins, which is programmable I/O device, which is where you clamp your your sensors. Uh, it needs a, a separate wireless interface, uh, but that's very cheap, perhaps five euros, and that plugs into one of the USB ports which is the second silver box at the, at the back. Uh, and there's a very simple uh, system topology. Um, and the output that the users see is graphical like that. So we didn't have these graphics back in the factory days. Uh, but we can very simply monitor two locations in the house. Upstairs is blue, the blue lines, downstairs is are the red lines, so you can see late at night and uh, early in the morning the activity is upstairs, during the day downstairs. Uh, it we can access that from any browser enabled device anywhere in the world and uh, you've essentially broken out of the factory for your observation. So just to, to give a compare comparison, um, this was done very quickly it's a prototype, and you can the means to to try new things is very easy. Um, we had to use very specialist equipment, hard to get hold of, very expensive in the past. Now you buy it off Amazon for for peanuts. Um, <coughs> the communications is much more sophisticated, but that too is almost commodity, you've, you've got it in your home. Uh, a very much simpler programming in interface and very much more comprehensive reporting. So that makes it all sound very easy, uh, but you need to note that what we've shown you, which was done in a few days, is a, a prototype. Demonstrates what's possible uh, and We'd argue the essence of the Internet of Things about control, about monitoring, about the currency of information. Uh, and the number of stakeholders... Oops, sorry. <coughs> so if we change it to a, a more industrial um, system, then we've got a lot more uh, complexities in scale. These sort of things are, once you're going across thousands of sites for an Internet of Things type implementation, you do need project management. Uh, as you get much more data available, then data management and data security become much more of a concern. Uh, and you, you see this in things like the UK smart metering rollout, which is, is a very major uh, and undertaking. And again, customer take stakeholders mean that you've got a much wider spread of requirements. But all these things are containable. On the technology side, again, we see radio becoming more important. We've heard a lot about 5G, but there are other technologies that may actually be cheaper in, s in some cases. So Zigbee seems to be the really popular one. Uh, a lot of the applications that I've looked at today are quite low bandwidth demands. Uh, if you look at low costs, we're, we're, these are, are all options today uh, at different price points, different throughputs and different topologies. So hopefully I've demonstrated how important real-time feedback systems are how they've been around for some time and how engineering knowledge of them has been around. Um, the importance of fusing IT and communication systems, not just the computer control, but the management of the data as well. Uh, a key thing is, in, both, in all, all of those systems, the implementers un understood what the users needed and what the systems needed to do. And that, to, to me, is a, a key success factor for the Internet of Things. Been very keen on 
on what processes you're taking over and how you're going to change them. Uh, in all cases, um, accurate reporting is very important. And it wouldn't be uh, a fitzy presentation without mentioning that, of course, we would expect IP protocols to be very important in uh, moving forward. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ed. And now we have time for one or two questions. Please, is there any question? So I, I would uh, ask you that what you have uh, presented for us, is that a dream or is it rea reality? So um, I think the point is, it is reality, we know how to do this stuff, mm -hmm. but at the same time, it's a dream because we're changing the environment, we're changing the number of users, we're changing the cross-section of users. So there, there is track record and challenge. Uh, okay. And that's the exci exciting thing. We, we, we understand the basis of what we have to do. What we have to do now is look at the wider problems we have to solve. Yeah. And they're okay. all solvable, I think. Okay. Thank you so much, Ed. Thank you. So, um, due to our timetable, we will come to the second speaker. Now we welcome our second speaker, Luis Castedo from Spain. And uh, Mr. Castedo, unfortunately, I had uh, no chance to meet you before, but it was my pleasure this morning. And uh, Castedo Luis is, uh, what can he be? He is a professor. He is a professor at the University of Acarunia. And now I am informed the abbreviation UDC is University uh, of uh, Acarunia. Um, Luis uh, received the PhD Telecom Engineering from the Technical University of Madrid. Previously, he had several research appointments at the University of South California and at the Ecole Supérieure Su Superior, uh, de Electricité, je pense, uh, c'est à Paris. Since uh, uh, 2014, he also has been a manager in a research program of the State Agency of Spain. Luis is very busy in publishing scientific papers, and he is engaged in chairing conferences on a European level, like the uh, 27th European Signal Processing Conference in 2019 in La Coruña. Luis's uh, research interests are signal processing and coding in wireless communication engineering. Luis is married and has a 14 years old boy and his spare time he spent time with his family and plays the violin it would be interesting uh, his music to hear but uh, nevertheless let's attend your presentation enabling automatic event detections for the pipe workshop of the shipyard 4.0 you have the floor Okay, Guntram, thank you very much for your kind presentation. I feel a little ashamed because of my private <laughs> activities. It's true that I like very much music, but now it's, uh, in the audience is more interested in my technical, in my technical work. Okay, so uh, good morning, everyone. I'm going to make a presentation of this work, enabling automatic event detection for the pipe workshop of the shipyard 4.0. So work that has been done with my colleagues from the University of La Coruña. Part of them, they belong to the, to the uh, computer engineering department, but others belong to the naval engineering department, as well as from the company of Navantia. This is the outline of my presentation. I will start with uh, motivating the problem I will consider. 
Then I will move into the description of the cyber physical system we have designed for the introduction of information and communication technologies into the process of handling the pipes into a shipyard. This is very related with the topic of this, uh, of this session, which is Industry 4.0. Then I will move into describing models and techniques, more specific issues related to this physical, uh, cyber physical system design. Then I will move into the deployment and show you the results of some experiments, and I will end my presentation with conclusions and further work. Okay, this work is motivated by a joint research unit that has been recently set up between the University of La Coruña and the shipping company Navantia. As you know, Navantia is a public industry company that makes, uh, but, uh, that makes ships, more specifically makes uh, uh, battleships. And uh, Navantia, one of the most recent programs is to set up a new generation of battleships. It's called the Fragatas uh, 110. It's to substitute the older Fragatas, which are Fragatas uh, F-80. So it is a very long-term project. It is supposed that we are now in the process of starting the definition of this, of this, of the characterization and the specifications of the battleships that should be finished like uh, in, in between 2020 and 2025. So Navantia is very much interested in taking this window of opportunity of constructing a new generation of battleships to incorporate information and communication technologies into all their processes of the shipyards in order to achieve a further step into the idea of improving competitiveness and also being more, uh, more, uh, more efficient while the construction of any kind of, uh, of ships in their factories. Okay, this is, uh, in this slide you can take a look of the one part of the shipyard, which is located in the city of Ferrol, very close to La Coruña, and this is the a specific uh, part of the shipyard devoted for the pipes. Here you can see the pipes. Uh, the pipes are, is, a, is a very important part of a ship. In fact, the pipes conduct any kind of uh, materials, water, uh, fuel, and many other, uh, uh, many other uh, materials that you need for the ship to work properly. So when the construction of, 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 of a ship, the handling and the efficient management of, the, of all these pipes is a crucial issue. And this is the scope of the, uh, my presentation, to show you a system, a cyber-physical system that, that we have developed at the University of La Coruña together with Navantia in order to make a traceability of these pipes and have um, a precise idea of where, at which step, each pipe is in the process of the construction of the, of the ship. Okay, in these slides you can take a look of the map. This is uh, the different parts of the, of the nave where we're constructing the shipyards. The idea is to use the tags, radio frequency identification tags, to label each of the pipes. And then we will develop a me measurement system all over the shipyard in order to have information regarding these tags and therefore its associated pipe. Okay, the theory physical system we have constructed is the following. It is basically the, the deployment of several readers of these radio frequency identification tags is put on strategic places all over the shipyard and uh, all these uh, beacons are continuously active and they are continuously monitoring all the labels that are around. Again, all this system is at the same time completely connected. All the beacons are connected, and at the same time, as through this central service, has a connection to the internet through an Ethernet or, or Wi-Fi connection. This is the block diagram of the of the architecture of this our cyber physical system. On the one hand, you can identify here the pipe information database. This is all the information related to the pipes and information related to the labels. Okay, 
this part here on top is the part of the cyber physical system related to the localization, to the localization and traceability. Is the part of the cyber physical system related to the readers, to the tags, and all the process of reading the information from the tags. And everything is combined on these other modules with business intelligence, which handle at a high level all the measurements that are being collected by our physical system. Well, it's important to model, especially the propagation of the signals in order for the, to get especially the positioning information related to the reading of the, of the tags in the shipyard. Okay, the position is determined basically because there is a relationship between the received signal strength and the distance. And the model is as simple as this one, which is a very uh, popular model in uh, radio propagation. So you have a reference value for the received power at distance d sub zero, and then you know that the attenuation scales logarithmically with the distance with an exponent factor, and that is to be determined because it depends on the propagation conditions that exist in the yard. Okay, you know that propagation is not deterministic. You know propagation is random by nature, so this randomness is modeled by this random variable, which plays an important role, because you will see that one of the major difficulties we have with determining distance from the radio, from the received signal strength, is that that of the noise, that of the stability of this uh, measurement. How do we more specifically carry out from the different readers to determine the position? Okay, what we have done is to deploy all over the shipyard some calibration spots. We're in these calibration spots, we know specifically which are the propagation conditions, and we know specifically where, uh, where the position of this calibration stops. And the idea is that when a pipe is moving all over the, 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 the shipyard, we make kind of a, 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 a comparison, a comparison of the, of the received signal strength with that of the calibration strength. So we associate a weight to each of the, um, of, of the, of the calibration spots. And from these weights, we determine kind of a probability of that a given uh, label is related to some specific, to some specific, uh, to some specific spot. So then we determine the global probability with this uh, formula, and the, the decision rule we made for the final localization is obtained with the maximum probability of the candidates. So this is the calibration spot that we determine as the reference for the position of our pipe. If two candidates have the same uh, probability, we perform a geometric mean between their uh, candidates. Okay, this is the, 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 the main idea. Um, of course, what I will explain later on is that this basic idea has to be refined in order to have a better, uh, uh, better accuracy of the determination of the position of the pipes. Well, one very simple way of improving the quality of your measurements is by this simple filtering operation, like this. Okay, it's very simple, very basic combination of the measurement you obtained previously with the measurement that you are obtained in present. You combine and you get a more, uh, a, a more refined uh, measurement. You can do things even more sophisticated. For instance, if you want to consider the movement of the pipe all over the shipyard, you have to resort to more uh, sophisticated filtering techniques like Kalman filter. Well, it's not my aim to go into the details of Kalman filtering. It's one of the problems of being an academic that we tend a lot in our presentations to put a lot of equations and try to think that the audience is very much interested in our algorithms. But it's basically an algorithm that incorporates the dynamics of the movement all over the shipyards and therefore provides more accurate uh, localization estimations. Okay, this is a second slide on more details of the Kalman filtering. Well, this is the observation model. Well, you have a Kalman filter is rather standard in, in signal processing. And at the end, you have to determine the Kalman gain specific to your model. And then you run up the algorithm, you program the algorithm into your cyber physical system. 
A second idea, a second technology that we incorporated in our cyber physical system is multiple antennas techniques. It is possible, you will, I will show some pictures of, of our readers, but they have two antennas. So it is possible to take advantage that spatial diversity exists all over the shipyard, so we can combine the different measurements obtained from the, each of the specific antennas. There are very different numbers of combining methods, also selection methods. We, uh, selection means that from the two observations that you get, you select one of them. Combination methods it means that you combine all the measurements to produce an improved uh, measurement. Equal gain combining is simply the adding of the, of the, of the obtained uh, data. More sophisticated combination like maximum ratio combining can also be used. Okay, this is part of our research and our development. Okay, I will move into showing an experiment and the results of uh, how this cyber physical system works. Okay, this is a picture of a worker in the shipyard. This worker is right now here in this very first pi picture is programming the reader and programming the information that is going to be in the tag. On the right, you can see the carriage that is usually uh, used to move the, the pipes all over the shipyard. And the, the, the first thing is the first preliminary condition is that the tags have to be very specific for the application we are considering, have to be also mechanically very robust because the pipes will suffer very strong physical processes and chemical process. They have to be cleaned, they have to be greased, they have to be rinsed. So the, the, the tags have to support all these very aggressive uh, mechanical uh, operations. This is something that we, we successfully did. And in fact, this is the, the tag we used with the mechanical encapsulation. And this is the reader. This is a picture of the reader where you can appreciate the two antennas for the, spatial, for the uh, exploitation of the spatial diversity. Okay, this is a result that shows, these are the experimental results that we obtained at nine different positions in the shipyard. One of the things you can appreciate is that the error varies significantly. Sometimes we have very high precision, other times the precision is not that high. But on average, you can see that our precision is less than one meter, that considering how large is the shipyard and how straight the application is a sufficient uh, uh, accuracy. Also, one of the problems we have is that the accuracy changes with time. This is what is represented in this picture. This is the precision, the variance of the measurements at the very beginning, at time zero, when we are carrying the calibration. After 5,000 seconds, which is more than one hour, the problem is that measurements are completely different. This is because there are many external ambient causes that produce changes in the propagation. For instance, the reading angle, the antenna angle, the height, multiple interference, people moving around, stacking of the pipes. I mean, at the end, RSS is a very unstable measurement. Okay, and then we develop the software module. The previous was the physical segment of our, our cyber physical system, and now the software module. This is the raw data. The raw data is taking continuously from the, from the measurements the, the, um, the coordinates of the position of the pipes. And this is done something that we translate into a map. We translate into a map. Here you can appreciate in, in blue are the position of the different uh, pipes all over, distributed all over the shipyards. And we have total control of absolutely all the pipes that are being involved in the current process in the shipyard. There is a graphical user interface related to this uh, application, so you can select, you can make uh, particular filters of the pipes that you are more interested. Okay, here's an example where there is a, a window that opens and that selects a very specific pipe that all over the all over the shipyard. And then you get also an historical information of what different actions, what different events have happened all over the day or all over the, 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 the process of, of in, in assembling the different pipes in order to be in the ship.
this video is basically a summary of the conclusions of my presentation. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Luis. It was very interesting to, uh, to learn it. <laughs> and uh, for me, it was uh, interesting uh, that you need so much mathematics. <laughs> Do you have any question? Okay, yours. Uh, there are plastics out, outdoor, uh, outside. I mean, it's the encapsulation. What is in plastic? Inside it, there is a, it's an active tag. It incorporates a battery, a lithium battery, oh, okay. uh, together with uh, a, a conventional tag. Oh, I thought, uh, I thought, why aren't you using the things they use on dogs and some people as well nowadays? Uh, but you do actually. Yeah, exactly. Okay. It's a simil similar. It's Thank a you. Similar, uh, okay. So due, due to the time, I think so, we should uh, close now uh, your presentation and I will come to our next speaker. Our next speaker is uh, Oscar Palarols from Spain too. Oscar, his first name sounds German. I don't know, maybe you can give us, give us some information. <laughs> um, Oscar is with uh, Zellnet uh, Telecom as head of innovation and product strategy. He started his career at Accenture, an important company in the consulting industry. Then he was digital transformation director at Mobile World Capital Barcelona. And I have learned Barcelona will be a smart city in the future. Uh, Oscar joined then to sell next telecom. Oscar is a telecommunication engineer with a long career in the world of consulting and technology. Oscar is married and had three young sons. There are four, five, and eight years. Congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> and I think so you have many family duties. <laughs> Besides his family duties, he likes field hockey and trekking. Yes, he wants to give us a message that a digital transformation program is required. Oscar, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you to the COIT. Thank you to FITSE to invite Cellnext to share our learnings very much related to IoT and uh, Industry 4.0. So I'll do a kind of different presentation. So I want to be back to the foundations, to the basics of IoT, as what we have learned in this journey we've been running in Celnex for at least one and a half year since we have a national-wide IoT network uh, for all Spain. So that means that we've been uh, doing a really, I always say, a kind of evangelization work to create the awareness on the industry to really understand what the IoT is. And this is, I would say, pretty much easy if we talk to the big ones, and we, any car manufacturer, any chemical company, but what happens when you talk to an SME? What happens when you talk to a small and medium companies? There are many of them in this country, thousands of them, very much related to the industry, but still, still to run, to walk a path on this journey. And this Learnings is the way I want to introduce my speech and to develop it. So I'll go through next. IoT, very easy. That means putting somehow eyes, noses, ears everywhere. So that means for the first time that we have the option to capture on real time, a fact, an objective value that at some point in our value change can be a business sense, a uh, production sense, a healthy sense, but at least what does it mean? It means having A's everywhere. And this is a very important because that means that physical goods gets a, a higher dimension thanks to internet to, let's say, go through its physical size and to provide some information on that point. 
And that's very important because now, as uh, Telefonica CTO said, this is just the first wave. We are on the easy part of IoT. Let's say the more, let's say the easy one sensors. But we will talk about the next generation sensors and the disruptive sensors that they can provide you like an eye somewhere providing you that data. So this is the fact that we need to leverage all our speech when trying to, let's say, promote IoT solutions. Next important message. This is a value change. And this value change needs to be understood in order to deploy your solutions and to get the business, the business profit and the business value that you really expect. What's important is understanding this process. And there are different percentage of the value according to the stage we are. Let's look at the first one. The first one is the sensor. What I want to capture? What is the measurement that I want to do? There are sensors which are pretty, mar pretty much familiar. Uh, they exist on the market, but there are many things that we want to measure that there's not ex the sensor yet to measure it. And this is a challenge. So what is the value of the sensor depends at some use cases, the value of the sensor is really high because capturing that data is most of the value. Second step, I have that data, I need to send through a comms network. What is this communication network to be? What are the features? What are the capabilities? What are the, the area this uh, network covers? We will go through later on. Then I need to collect the data kind of funnel, getting that data, let's say from the raw point of view, not value yet. But at least I need to treat that data. Many times there's noise, there all the data is mixing, I just want that piece of data, and this is a process to build on, a kind of filtering. And the fourth, which is the most crucial, and probably has a couple of steps, one with the, with the head, with the brain, it is I need to apply my business logic to that data to get something valuable. And on the line below, if I have data enough, if I have massive data related to that process, to that uh, sensor, maybe, maybe I can run an analytics process to predict something because of this so much uh, information that I, that I have coming from that sensor experience. And finally, which is the last step, what I'm going to do. I'm going to act. It's the action, the actionability that I need to do on, in this example, on my processes. At some point of my manufacturing processes, at some point of my selling chain, at some point of my relationship with the customer, I need to act. Because that data that I was taking very much on the early stage has only sense if I later on act at some point. And these are the fundamentals of this IoT approach. Let's go through an example. I'm getting 31. I'm getting 31 from a sensor. It's been communicated through a network, and it's been filtered through a, a process doing a kind of normalization of data. 31 is just a raw number, but can be many things. Can be, as it's shown on the picture, a temperature higher than 31. Sorry, higher than 30. So if this is a temperature higher than 30, it means launching an alarm, saying, hi, something's happening, because 30 is a threshold. So fixing what are the thresholds that makes these systems work standalone and providing value, it's relevant. And in these thresholds are not always the same, depend. And everything that depends of many things, it's much more complex. But imagine that we have information about uh, information enough, enough, sorry, about many of these sensors, and we can somehow predict, and this is below, now we have an alarm of uh, 31 degrees uh, over a 30 degrees threshold, but I have an information that the next alarm is going to come in two hours in a specific location because I can predict this. I can do some analytics on top of. And this is the example that really allows you to action, in this case, doing something. And we will see later on what are the big barriers for a company 
to do something when they get IoT implemented at home, at the, at the let's say, at, at the company. Let's go through each one of the pieces. Let's talk about sensors. There are so many sensors, as, so, as many cases there are. Sensors are crucial. If you leverage on a sensor in the market, that's going to be much more easy and cost effective. If you leverage on a sensor that you want to design and deploy, you know what is the electronics life cycle. Designing the electronics, testing for a long time, doing a stretch test, and finally getting something that probably on the first wave, beta version, is not robust enough. So balancing between what is the data I want to get and what is the sensor I'm going to reach, this is a fundamental to make IoT really explode. We are sure about Gartner and Cisco forecast of uh, 20 billion things connected on the 2020 and all this stuff. But from Celnex, we do not agree on the time they expect this to happen. This will happen later. This will happen later. I will ask to any of you how many really connected things with uh, IoT networks are in your homes? Almost zero. Almost zero. If we forget about anything on SIM based, almost zero. So I fully agree with uh, Telefonica CTO that we need to think about 5G and low latencies and a density of one million per uh, square kilometer and so on. But now we are just on lesson one. And lesson one needs starting from, let's say, scratch, start testing with real context and understanding the value. Because in the case you really get that data, probably you have not the structure in the company to react and to make, to make that action possible. Let me think about the disruptive sensors uh, beyond 2025, 20, 2030, 2022. 20, Imagine a sensor getting information about existing microbial life. Can you imagine that? You have in your office a sensor which is just looking at if microbial life is in that space. So you can get real time and information, do not come in. You will get the flu in two minutes. You need to reschedule your agenda because in three days you will be bad. This is really what sensors can provide. Think about any chemical, chemical sensors detecting specific uh, elements that are really meaningful comparing to the information we have nowadays. Temperature, pressure, uh, uh, opening the door, closing the door, that's the easy part. Still many value to get from, but that's the easy part. So the big thing will be, once we solve this process, as I show, more or less, we don't have the truth, we have an experience, it's our experience and this is what we want to share with you. But the big thing will be when we need to start, and this is very important, what are the questions that I want to solve? Because that determines the sensor I need to deploy and that determines how I will react when I have that information. Let me explain one example. This is real from Celnex. We have one million connected things in our Sigfox network in Spain. All these are billable sensors. That means there's a business, kind, business case, business model behind it of these uh, one million things. We have now, a, related to creating sensors from scratch, we have uh, the manholes on the road to access on the pipes and so on. We have a sensor identifying when a manhole is open or not. And that's because security and police reasons to identify if someone is getting that hose. This is a very stable service. And police works with this service in Spain, in some specific uh, city. We're getting false opens, not because a truck of 18 tons goes over and creates a magnetic field, but when the cleaning trucks with the brushes making circular movements, iron brushes making circular movements, and just coincides with the manhole, it generates a false open. This is an example how much we need to work on the sensor to make it really valuable. 
just an example of our experience. When we, look, when we go through about the network, what is the area to be covered? Many times it's a hyper-connected place, so you don't need too many strange things. Just go through fiber and some sabers and Wi-Fi and Bluetooth and, and maybe 4 or 5G. But when you look at really wide extensions like national wide and so on, you need LPWA. You need low power wide area networks. And this is our case in Cellnex with, uh, with Sigfox. When there's one sensor from Sigfox sending in Spain one message, normally this, I would say the case that we have test that most more remote units get that message, it's 150. 150 remote units get that message from a national-wide network. If we look on the seaside, we can get a reception over 500, 500 kilometers. If it's high-density place, 150 kilometers. This is an ultra-narrow band network. That means delta is sending deltas. And because of deltas, it's very difficult to inhibit. And this is the value of these networks for instance, in case like security. But, as I said, what is the question I want, I want to answer? What is, imagine that we are selling goods products. What is the question I want to make to my product when this product is working at my customer's home? What I want to know, who's using this, how? What is the stretch level, how many times? This is the question to be solved before starts testing whatever. So what I really want to test, what, I w what is valuable for me, and then go through that chain and decide what is the physical magnitude that I want to get, what is the kind of sensor, what is the network I'm going to use. But this is the normal. The logics behind IoT is always business and information logics. It's not technology logics, but it's a technological project, for, for instance. So, because of this, I'm going now to the big piece of this, uh, uh, let's say, challenge, which is digital transformation. I'm in an organization, I have very good technical guys, they get whatever we want, but we are not ready to provide answer to the market to that information. I mean, you know when you have a product and you make some digital pressure on that product, that product normally has a mutation to a service. I'm really ready to become a service company instead of company uh, selling products. Do I have people to interact immediately with my customer? Do I need people on the field, for, on the field side to manage the life cycle of my services? What I do with that data? Do I have field force full time connected to that to get that information real time? And this is the barriers that Cellness is looking for many, many, many times. I'm getting the information, but I don't know how to act to make that action really real. So, how do we get that? And this is our suggestion. This is a two directions trip. One, which is top down. We need the CEO, the steering board, the strategy very much aligned. We want to be the, do, do this. We want to get that digital advantage on our uh, proposition, market proposition. But we need also a bottom-up approach. We need to start testing those technologies, asking the right questions with the technical guys and going up. And at some point, this will meet. Related to the uh, industry 4.0, Whatever you think, it's possible. Whatever you think, it's possible. But it will take more time or less, more money or less. But most of the things are possible. If you look at the chain, everything related to the logistics, uh, tracking, we've seen some examples about tracking, physical, getting any physical condition which is relevant, security, looking at the, let's say, the manufacturing uh, zone, everything related to machinery, everything related to utilities, utilities and consumptions, energy, gas, uh, water, electricity, whatever, uh, processes, taking information in the processes to be more efficient or to change and to make it more, uh, let's say, uh, time to market, uh, shorter, 
everything related to uh, valuable things, understanding where the thi these things are, what are the conditions, inventories, and so on. But I repeat, this is the easy part. The easy part. What is our experience in Celnex? And this is my, my last slide. This is our experience. We have one million things connected in Spain. This is the most uh, relevant case uh, worldwide in Sigfox networks. So Thelnex has uh, more than 25% of the things connected on Sigfox worldwide only in the Spanish network, as we are Sigfox operator here. What are the six sectors that we really focus? Security, because this is an ultra narrow one, so you send a delta, and it's very relevant for security reasons. Tracking, tracking, it's not a high resolution tracking, because there are other ways, but it's tracking enough for some of the use cases. Everything related to facility management can be a hospital, can be a corporate office, can be a campus, can be a whatever, can be a city, as we are providing the smart city platform in Barcelona, so this is one of the examples. Then everything at home, especially for elderly people with, let's say, hidden sensors, only for taking care of that people. Someone has not come in the toilet for 24 hours. Someone living alone, elderly people. We need to send an alarm somewhere. Or fire detection telemetrics. So my final message is IoT is not only a wow effect. It's really cool getting that data. It's about understanding what is my company, how I'm organized, and having the commitment from top and from, let's say, bottom levels to get this meeting point and to make it real. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, uh, Oscar, for your sophisticated uh, presentation. Thank you. And I think we are in time. And uh, I propose, if you have questions, please uh, contact uh, uh, Oscar after this session. And I have to thank all the three speakers. Thank you very much.